Thank you good so much here. for joining. Oh, good. I have my questions. Woof. All right. So. It's quite a bright light you have here. It's and it's a little chilly. I know you guys were worried a little bit about being yeah, a little chilly Jaws. up here. Yeah. Um, I also like to welcome our Twitter audience who is watching now live. So, I've called you both here to talk about um, really a a, a a big problem. It's really it's a, glo a global <laughs> crisis at this point, and I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it up here. Let's see if I can get this here. Uh -oh, All right. Props. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So terrifying. It is. It is. It's. It's quite a problem. Um, we're going to start with you, Jaws. Actually, you okay. know what? They gave me a pointer as well. You're not going to hit me with that. Oh yes, I know. <laughs> depends I, uh, on the answer. <laughs> it depends on the answer. So, what do you what do you see when you look at this? I see two really cool connectors. <laughs> yeah, kind of the two most popular connectors in the world, I think, right now. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Craig, I know you're a software guy, but what do you see? I got to really agree with Jaws on this one. These oh, are two yeah? great connectors. Two great connectors. Yeah. Okay. I see a little bit of a mess. One of them has a much really? better name, though, don't you think? Lightning, yes, Lightning. So, yes. One name by marketing people, one name by engineers. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I see a little bit of a mess. And so I'll, I'll tell you, really? the, right? So this charges the iPhone. I'm not sure you guys know that. This charges the iPhone. Mm -hmm. Now this charges the Mac and iPad and various other products around the world. And so that's creating a little bit of friction. In fact, the EU has approved legislation to create a common charger. In fact, they said in a press release yesterday, in 2024, a USB-C port will become mandatory for a whole range of electronic devices such as mobile phones, tablets, and headphones. I think that includes you guys. <laughs> Is Apple moving to USB-C? Well, maybe I can step back a little bit. <laughs> You may. Um, You've probably heard me say for years that I, I don't mind governments telling us what they want to accomplish, but usually we've got some pretty smart engineers to figure out the best ways to accomplish them technically. And an example of that that I love to give is for years and years, mobile phones had to satisfy a hearing aid compatibility spec very prescriptively described by you know, regulation that said, here's what you have to do to, to be compatible with hearing aids. The problem is it didn't work, but all of us had to do it. And so we came up with a new way of doing hear hearing aids, made for iPhone uh, hearing aids, actually made it an industry standard. That actually worked. You know, so what we were accomplishing is what the government wanted, was is to have hearing impaired people be able to use phones, but we did it in a way that worked better. And, you know, we've been in an argument over this one for well over 10 years. And over 10 years ago, the push from the EU, look, they're well-meaning. I get, you know, I get the fact that they want to accomplish some good things, was to do micro USB and standardize as a micro USB. If we have standardized a micro USB, that chart doesn't exist, right? Neither of those happen. And so we have been in this little bit of a disagreement, and but part of what of course, they wanted to accomplish is why should people have all these different power adapters? So we got to what we think was a better place, right, which is power adapters that had detachable cables, mm -hmm. you know, all of them USB-A or USB-C, uh, and largely moving to USB-C, but you choose the cable, you know, that was appropriate for your device, uh, whether that's one of ours or somebody else's. And what uh, that allowed you to do is have over a billion people, it's not a small number of people that have that connector on the left, right, to be able to use what they have already and not have to um, be disrupted mm -hmm. by that and cause a bunch of e-waste as well. I mean, because what are you going to do with these cables over time if they're no longer useful? And again, billions of them, right, because everybody has more than one cable. And so we preferred that path. Uh, governments, you know, get to do what they're going to do. And obviously, we'll have to comply. We have no choice, as, as we do around the world, to comply to uh, local laws. But you know, we think it, the approach would have been better environmentally and better for our customers to, to not have a government be that prescriptive. What's so good about Lightning that you're so, you seem very sad to see it go? <laughs> well, it's been a great connector, and over a billion people have it already, have the cables, have what they need, have all the infrastructure in their homes, have speakers that work with it, all kinds of, you know, an ecosystem that works with it. And for most iPhone customers, it's primarily about charging, not all. 
yeah. but it's primarily about charging. Lightning charges pretty well. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I guess how soon might we see it? USB-C. Well, I, I, again, the the, <laughs> the Europeans are the ones dictating timing for European customers, and you know, you know their. But you wouldn't just roles. probably change it in one area. Oh, Joanna, you're trying to get me to predict the future, uh, or at least, okay. or at least disclose it. And you know me better than that. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> we'll move on to another part of the iPhone, or in in general, the iPhones marks 15 years of the iPhone, and um, the pace of innovation has obviously slowed. You're losing you, your visual aid. I'm losing my visual aid. It's okay. We're we have, it's we be have missed. more. We it have will be more. Missed. Oh. There will be more. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. This isn't an Apple style presentation, but there will be more. Okay. No track suits, <laughs> no no crazy hair blowing things. We don't have that. Um, back to the iPhone. Um, fifteen years. Very rapid pace of innovation at first, first five to seven years. And now it feels like things have, have slowed a little bit. And some people say phones have become boring, right? Wow. I think that's <laughs> other people's phones. Yeah. <laughs> and I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Ours are quite exciting. Two questions. One, why does there need to be a new iPhone every year? And two, where is the innovation left in phones? Wow. Well, first of all. And Craig, you can answer these two. Okay. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Joanna, one I of mean, the I mean, I wouldn't have loved to answer that last yeah. one, but I one think Jaws did wonderful. One of the things that I love, and you probably heard my story, but all the way back to the very first iPhone when we, you know, which didn't launch till six in the, in the afternoon that day, and yet there was a, people that camped out all night for it. People are still in lines waiting for new iPhones every year. They're excited by what we do. We think a lot of innovation, including in software and hardware, because as you know, we're, we're the guys that put it all together. People are very excited by the new iPhones. Dynamic Island, the things we do with 48 megapixel camera, all the things we did with the, the iPhone 14 and iPhone 14 Pro, I think it gets people very excited. So again, I can't speak for these boring phones you're talking about, but like I said, those sound like somebody else's. Yeah, and I'd just say that you said why every year. Uh, I think we always have a, a ton of stuff that I mean, we, we've got to get it out. I mean, we've been working on it for years and years. There's a pipeline of things that we feel are really going to positively impact our customers. If we can take a better picture, that's a year of capturing maybe your young family with a better picture. And I think that's meaningful. And yep. every year we work to harness the power of the best sensors we can create, the best silicon, the best computational photography pipeline we can manage. I think these matter to a lot of people. You don't have to buy a phone, a new one every year, but someone is going to decide they want the best camera they can get, that those capabilities are really compelling, and so we want to give them that option. Makes sense. When, well, you mentioned silicon. I think we're so used to so many of Apple's best products being new things we can see. Right? The iPod, the iPhone, iPad. Seems like one of your biggest innovations in the last, I would say, five years has been your own silicon in Max. Um, tell me about why you made that decision. Why did, why did you make the decision to leave Intel and say, we need to go at this on our own? Well, I mean, the story of our silicon is, uh, you know, goes back further than our transition to Apple Silicon on the Mac, right? This, uh, this journey started with the iPhone and Apple uh, has always deeply believed in controlling the technology that's most central to delivering the user experience for our products. And there's no doubt when it came to building the best phone possible that the application processor, which integrates all the functionality, it's, it's not just a CPU, it's not even just a graphics processor, it's a media pipeline, it's an ISP, it's, now it's about uh, artificial intelligence and a neural engine. I mean, fundamental aspects of building the, capa the, the experience of iPhone are tied up in that silicon and of course, in a mobile phone, it also drives the kind of industrial design you can manage when it comes to things like power efficiency. Mm -hmm. So controlling that was fundamental to building the right product. And our team really focused for years and years on the right problem that I think a lot of the industry was ignoring, which was power per watt, efficiency. Not just about peak performance at any, any power level, but performance per watt. 
and year in, year out, getting better and better at that. And we could chart out where that was going and where that was intersecting with what our other products needed, you know, high-end iPads and eventually Macs. And for those of us that had had the luxury for years on being able to spec out the experience for our customers going from silicon to the hardware to the software that was going to run on it and being able to do that with our in-house silicon when it came to iPhones and iPads and having to go through what we had to go with really making a lot of really unfortunate compromises when it came to silicon we didn't control on the Mac, we were really eager to get there when those performance lines crossed. And I think, I mean, you, you probably remember when that happened. Uh, we said at the time, it vastly exceeded our expectations, which is a kind of crazy thing. When you go to build something, you say, I think it's gonna be this good. And then we start running the tests and we put all the pieces together and we're saying, I mean, people are coming in going, my God, you, you wouldn't believe the numbers we're getting. You wouldn't, and which is crazy because we're pretty good at estimating these things, but overshot. And, and I think in, in all respects, our users have felt like it is, it has exceeded all of our expectations and it is a wonderful place to be. Yeah, and I, I think you have people who never really thought much about processors, right? Never really thought about Intel inside and now, has a, they have different experience on the Mac. And so well, you know, when we brought out that M1, I mean, people had a hard time believing what we were saying up on stage, I think a lot of you journalists, right? How can it be that much faster and give you this much more battery life? Because as Craig said, no one had really done that equation, right, where they focused on the power per watt, but every single journalist that reviewed it, right, every single, you know, tester that tested it, found the same conclusion, right? That it was unlike anything they'd ever seen. Faster and yet incredible battery life. And this is what we've been experiencing on iPhone for years. I mean, look, you, you heard us talk this year. We still, you know, have such an advantage that our competition's trying to catch up with where we were with iPhone 11, you know, from a performance standpoint. And we're at iPhone 14 and using less power than they're using. In and it's an experience thing, too, beyond just battery life and raw performance. I think you pointed out when we came out with it, the fans or the lack fans. of fans. Yeah. I mean, how long were we all cursed by just that, that buzzing? Uh, it, is, it is serenity to ha be able to use your computer and not hear it, right? And that, that took an incredible feat it's too of quiet silicon engineering. Is it too guys? quiet now? I'm it's sorry. It's just too quiet. You're just alone <laughs> with your thoughts, just yeah. haunted. If you yeah. can also make my kids a little bit quieter, it'll be great. <laughs> Great, we're on that. That's but it's a, a good point. Talk to it's, Johnny Saruji it, about it's that. It's a good we'll point because it's an entire system, right? It's the ISP, it's the unified memory. You know, there's just so many advantages to the architecture that, again, is new to PCs. So I'm gonna move to privacy in a few minutes, but I, I have a few questions and we don't have a lot of time, so I wanna do a rapid fire thing here. You get, oh, we like going slow. No, nah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the clock is running out, but you get five words to answer oh, no. each of these questions. Five words Five for words. each I'm, I'm question. I want to clarify the rules. I'm very confident you both Total of count. 10? Is there a point system? Um, <laughs> if you go over, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Will we ever see a touch screen on the Mac? Who's to say? Okay. <laughs> Why isn't there a calculator app on the iPad? Who's to say? <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you can't, you cannot six. use the same answer twice. <laughs> there are tons of them. Go to the App Store. Why doesn't Apple have a calculator app on the iPad? We do a handful of apps relative to the 1.8 million apps. You never wanted to add something on your, on your iPad? I use third-party apps. I just want to see you both yeah. violated the 10-word limit. I think it's time to move okay. on. Okay. <laughs> Why can't Siri set two timers on my iPhone? Who's to say? <laughs> <laughs> you can't keep saying who's to say. You know, we'll ask Siri. You didn't establish the rules clearly enough. I did front, not. I um, how many iPad models do you have right now? Who's to say? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're moving on from this. All right, you know what? We'll do this one, but you can get more time. Okay. In the words of the iPad commercial girl, what is a computer? Well, that's the thing. She doesn't need to she yeah, doesn't exactly. care. It doesn't matter because it does what she wants, you know? Yeah, I'm really getting nowhere. <laughs> really Where were you getting hoping nowhere. to get? And I crowdsource some of these questions. The people who are watching on Twitter, I'm sorry they're I'm not sorry, answering. I'm sorry, Twitter. I'm sorry. All right. <laughs> we're going to move to privacy. So back in 2021, you released App Tracking Transparency, or ATT, and it gave users more choice over 
sharing their data with other companies. It was this, let's see. Another prop. Tiny, tiny pop-up, yep. right? We have these tiny pop-ups all coming up on our phones, right? Yeah. A big, big business impact, right? Knocks billions in revenue off of companies like Meta, Google, others. Did you anticipate this domino effect? Uh, I'd, I'd say we, we couldn't be sure. Uh, I think we were truly just focused on doing the right thing. I mean, our conversations were just users. We'd, we'd been working for so many years to try to bring more transparency and control to so many areas of the experience. And years before, we'd brought uh, intelligent tracking prevention to Safari. And so we, we'd seen the problem of tracking on the web, and we'd been able to counter it uh, to in large part. And we felt the world of apps should be no different, that, that users should have the same uh, level of protection, or even, even better in, in the world of apps. Uh, and so uh, the privacy team that, that, that is in my organization, we, we set out to change it. And you know, I think there was uncertainty about what the short-term impact would be. I think we felt in the long term that quality advertising and pri privacy could coexist. There would be innovation, some of it from us, some of it from others. Uh, but that journey had to start. Uh, it, was, it was what we wanted for ourselves and our friends and our family. We thought it was people should have that level of control. And so that's the, that's the road we went down. Yeah, it's a similar question, Joanna. And it's just getting the user to say, yeah, that's okay. I mean, how many times have you shopped for something and all of a sudden you are now getting emails from other, you know, shoe companies when you buy shoes or you're seeing, you know, web ads everywhere? Sometimes that creeps people out and sometimes it's not as simple as shoes, right? And, and as you know, data brokers are building profiles on you, you know, based on what can be sent to them that you have no idea. So all we're saying is, look, Advertising's cool. Just get the user's permission if you're going to send it to other companies. And I think that's the part people miss, right? You, you, you can, obviously, if you interact with a the company, there's an expectation that they have some information on you. The, the creepy part and the part that people don't really, didn't totally grok is, no, they're selling, you know, all this information and building these profiles of you that you don't even know exists. You know, they know everything about you, right? And again, for some people, that's cool, you know, but at least ask your permission. And, and I think this felt really wrong to us because we knew even people in the industry didn't really understand the extent of what was going on, let, let alone the average user. And I, I mean, ultimately, we all came to Apple to build these products that we wanted to do good in the world. And the idea that these could be used in a way that our customers maybe didn't expect, in a way that was not in their interests, uh, that, that they should have a choice. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that was, in some ways, a really simple decision. I, I, there's been this feeling, though, that a little bit of the move has been hypocritical as Apple, or there are reports that Apple wants to move more into advertising. Is that any part of the motivation? Does Apple have? <laughs> well, I, I should, I should yeah. say first, zero part of the motivation. I can tell you, I mean, I've heard conspiracy theories that are crazy and weird to read because I personally was part of uh, the uh, discussion to go down this road and none of that, this was driven by our privacy team as part of a long agenda that you could watch in Apple's business year after year after year how we were stepping up privacy protections in area after area. This was our team going, you know, we feel protecting apps consistent with what we've done in Safari makes sense. We brought this to business and just said, heads up, everyone. You know we are doing this year after year privacy agenda. Here's what's coming. That is where this feature came from, full stop. And, and by the way, again, just to clarify, we're not against advertising. And by the way, we're hearing by it, all the same rules, right? We're not sending any of your information, you know, to anybody without your permission. As a matter of fact, we don't send it, period. And we give you options to even opt out of what we're keeping within you the company. You mean in your own app? In our own app. Yeah. yeah. So. That, that's right. I, and, I, and I think Craig, actually, you mentioned, yeah. not to cut you off, but you, you're, uh, it's interesting that you have this privacy roadmap. Obviously, those of us that watch all the, the WWDC keynotes, we know that now to expect sort of the privacy section, right? 
what is the reason for that? I mean, is that does it help sell more phones? Are people buying because it, there's privacy? It's, it's well, it's funny. It's funny you say that because for many many years, this this journey for us on privacy, in, in some ways, started with with the origin of the of the the company as a personal computer. I mean, our, our sensibilities at Apple are. You had your computer, you had your floppy disks, there was no mainframe that had your data, you owned your data. I mean, this is just so core to what sort of feels right to us. But if you go back to when we created iPhone, we put all these protections in place. So the app has to ask if they want to access your photos. They have to ask if they want to use your camera. You know, all of this was completely new to the industry, but something we felt really uh, strongly about. And as, as time went on, there was a lot of discussion that we were in a uh, not within Apple, but outside. We are in a post-privacy world, and isn't AI all about needing all the data? So, and then, does anyone actually care? And within Apple, we're saying, it doesn't matter. This is what we think is right. And again, these are the products we want for ourselves. I, you know, for, for my kids, I didn't want them using products that, mm -hmm. uh, where people were ser slurping up their data, sharing it all over the place. So we were constantly doing these things that I think the rest of the industry thought we were Crazy! This is surely holding us back. You could, I'm sure, you could find articles in your your own paper, perhaps, I, saying I this years and it. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah what is that? that? Why? Yeah. What is Apple's problem? Like, why are yeah. they so obsessed with this stuff? And so it's it's just wild to me now when people come, oh, Apple, aren't you just doing this because it's so hot? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> you know, no, we're doing it because it's right. And you know, at the time, we said, well, maybe someday someone's going to realize when they fully become yeah. aware of how this is being abused, maybe they're going to say. Well, thank goodness Apple was doing something about this, but that has never been the reason we've done anything in this area. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm running out of time, but you guys have nothing else to do tonight, right? I, we came <laughs> here to see you. Really? Yeah. Okay. And go to the bar after. Well, hell yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, you know, speaking of, we're talking a little bit about ecosystem, Craig, and I, I want to read you back an email of yours from 2013. You might, you might have read it before or written it before. Uh, it was to Apple's <laughs> Eddie Q, he's a colleague of yours, and you said, I'm concerned that iMessage on Android would simply serve to remove an obstacle to iPhone families giving their kids Android phones. Whatever happened to iMessage on Android? I'm not aware of it shipping. Yeah. You sent this email, though. You I sent did. this email. You felt like maybe we shouldn't release this product because other people will buy Android phones. My feeling, and I, I think F1 read the whole, the whole email, it was clear the back and forth with Eddie was, if, if we're going to enter a market and go down the road of building an application, we have to be in it uh, in a way that's going to make a difference, that we would have a lot of customers, that we would be able to deliver great experiences. This comes at a real cost. And my fear was we weren't in a position to do that. Hmm. And so if we just shipped an app that really didn't get critical mass on other platforms, what it would have accomplished is it would have held us back in innovating in all the ways we wanted to innovate in messages on, uh, for our customers and wouldn't really have accomplished much at all in any other way. And so we just felt, you know, pick, pick where you can make a difference. Pick where you're gonna invest and do it where, where you'd make a difference. And, and this seemed like a, a throwaway that wasn't going to serve uh, the world, honestly. One of the big themes of the conference and has been around the, obviously, the macro environment uh, and return to work. And so, you know, it kind of strikes me every time I go to Apple's campus, well, who wouldn't want to be at this campus five days a week? Um, but you guys have <laughs> returned to work a couple days a week. Um, how are you, and, and some, it sounds like some folks at Apple have, they don't want to get back to the office, they do, there's this tension between some folks. How are you managing through that as you manage? Well, well uh, first of all, I'll speak for myself. I think you probably <laughs> know. I love going to Apple Park. <laughs> you know, so I've been going back. You know, I think 2020 we were mostly missed. You know, we did some filming of our events. You're familiar with those. Uh, but I started coming back long before we were asked, and a bunch of people did. There's always going to be a spectrum of folks, right? I think one of the things that we're uh, and people are amazed to see is you get back and you do remember the power of collaboration. 
Uh, people love to tell their little anecdotes of things that they were able to accomplish because they were in a room together in front of a whiteboard. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a book, uh, sorry to go here, but uh, Golf in the Kingdom, right, which is a famous kind of Zen golf book. Uh, and one of the things I always remember for it, it's, it's what's between the holes that counts. And, and the reality is life is not just meetings. Sometimes it's what's between the meetings 100%. that count, right? It's the conversations you have. Sometimes they're social nature, and that's okay because we're bonding, we're building a culture. You know, sometimes they're that, let's say a little extra and talk on the whiteboard about something we can do together. WebEx, you know, uh, which we use, you know, Zoom, others people use, just don't lend themselves to that. But they do have a purpose, right? And they're pretty efficient for getting meetings done. So what we try to do is a blend of both, right? We have three days in the office, right? Two days that everybody's in the same day, Tuesday and Thursday, there's commonality. Third day, the teams can decide. I think most teams have decided on Wednesday, but some are moving that around. Uh, and then the other two are do it on, you know, on WebEx. And I think it's a nice blend, you know, of, of learning new tricks. And by the way, one of the things that we've said, it's a hybrid, uh, you know, I mean, it, and, it's, it's, and it's a pilot, right? And that we'll see how it goes and we'll figure out how we make things better because that's what we do. We're Apple. We're always trying to figure out how to make things better, uh, as you would expect. This is one of those areas as well. We're, we're better and we're happier when we're together. I, is that a song? I, we can write Is one. Is that a new song? We got explains these microphones. We got the right <laughs> mic. We can dance. We got it hands free. Um, you do look like Britney Spears. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's been a real. It's I mean, the, the hair. Long the hair, hair, hair is almost and as nice. Hair. Honestly, I've, it's yeah. something I've been working yeah. on. Uh, All right. But the the. I mean, it's it's strange that as as we were in the pandemic and we'd all talk about the. The, you know, depression and the mental health crisis, and we talk about how our kids were, were devastated by the lack of connection, and yet somehow we thought we weren't affected by this, that, that all of us wouldn't benefit from being connected with the people with whom we're doing the most important work of our lives. I, I think it's crazy, and when we've been back, we are so much more effective, and we are enlivened and invigorated and happy and finding that space in between meetings and making decisions and spotting problems earlier and coming up with better ideas. And this has been fundamental to Apple's way of being forever. I mean, our, our, our whole culture has been about being in the same place together, building products in tight interdisciplinary teams. And that's, that's who we are. And when you hear uh, I, I mean, I think it's an honestly, it's a big disservice that I, when it, with what I read where people say, oh, Apple employees don't want to come back. What are they referring to? They're referring to a petition by like, I don't know, a tenth of a percent of Apple employees. Of course, there's some people who moved to Kansas and said, this is where I want to be. Sure, is that Apple employees? It's an, an Apple employee. Um, but I think a lot of us are um, thrilled to be able to engage with one another. And I think it's important. Um, does it also mean more face time with your boss? I was going to just quickly ask what, it, what it's like to work for Tim Cook. Does he, does he bother you guys on iMessage? Does he <laughs> come to my office right now? Well, he's actually great for in-person meetings, by the way. A lot of Snapchat, though. Yeah. Le the lenses. He's heavy with the lenses. Yeah. Def definitely <laughs> likes in-person meetings, and I think we, we have some you know, inc incredibly important dialogue together, and together as an executive team. You know, we have a yeah, lot, we, of, we lot of time together. We've always met together for hours yeah. uh, every week. I mean, that's a staple to, to our, our culture. And, of course, Tim leads those meetings. How's the work on the Apple car coming? The Apple card? The little white one? <laughs> um, yeah, the, but the car. Oh, i sorry. I thought you said Apple <laughs> card because Apple card's doing quite well. Uh, I suggest you all get one. You know, pays you money back. Doesn't cost anything. Really cool. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. How about the the headset? How's that work coming? AirPods. Uh, no, that see you, nothing rhymes AirPods. with headset. AirPods. Are nothing great. rhymes AirPods with headset. AirPods are wearable. Phenomenal. Spatial audio. It's gonna blow your mind. It is probably when you build it into the headset, <laughs> right? Um, I'm gonna ask you the same question I asked Evan Spiegel though. Um, you have to finish this sentence, both of you. The metaverse is a word I'll never use. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, the metaverse is. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
yeah, you guys aren't going to tell me anything about new products. Um, but I, I do, you know, but we can end here on, at Apple, you must at some point come to a sense of this is an R&D product. This is a project that's R&D. At what point does something go from, well, I'd love you to take me through the whole process, but how do you get from something that's R&D to something that's ready to ship? Is there a process of how you think about what that is? Well, there's a lot of technologies yeah. we work on for years, you know, and sometimes they become enabling technologies to create other things. You know, a, a classic example of that is the multi-touch display, right? We worked on that for years before there was an iPhone, and as you know, and as we talked about, you know, publicly, we were applying that to a different project uh, mm -hmm. before we decided to apply it to the what became the iPhone. So it's always hard to say. That's why sometimes it's hard to say even when some projects start because, well, what do you mean? Because the technologies may have been something that we've been, uh, we've been gestating for quite some time. Yeah, there's, there are so many threads of exploration in experiences we want to create in fundamental technologies that could enable those experiences. Some of them are in the background percolating for years and years because there's something we know we want to get to, but the pieces aren't quite there. And then there are points where we think we can start to put these pieces together and we're building prototypes and we're seeing what, what might work. But even then, to get to the final product, sometimes that's involving, yeah, but we're going to need the, f the following pieces of custom silicon to make that happen. And we're going to need the following you know, camera system with these sensors. And uh, that can be years and years of lead time. Um, and in the end, when you look at a great Apple product, it involved almost every discipline imaginable, the full, the full breadth of the talent of the company from, from design to silicon and everything in between. And what's, I think, so incredible about being part of it at Apple is none of us could do it without all of us together, that, and that when we decide there is an experience we want to deliver, there's a product that we want to create, it can be, at that point, four years out, five years out, and everybody is going to align and everyone's going to make it happen, and uh, we will knock d through walls, uh, many walls, because we know uh, we all depend on each other to get it done. And, and I think it's... Uh, yeah, it's just amazing to be part of that group of talented people with that passion to make it happen. But it's it, a long process. It is one of those. If we can imagine it, we really feel that we can create it because of our ability to do, you know, incredible world-class software and class hardware and now world-class services all combined. We think we can create things that just it's, it's hard to create anywhere else. So you're imagining a car? <laughs> She's so obsessed with that Apple card. Yeah. And it's already out. Yeah. Oh, I'll leave up this, this last question then. Apple is still a computer company, right? Computers now are taking so many different shapes and forms. What do you both wish your computers did better? I think that's a trick to get us to tell you what's coming in the future. Yeah, because yeah, really it kind of goes, if you follow the logic, we can <laughs> imagine it, we can create it. So if I can tell you what we can imagine, do something better, we're creating it. It's a you trick, must, Joanna. You must work in marketing. <laughs> That was beautiful, John. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're not going to answer. No. No, because it'll be too only in the future. Because again, we, you look. You can you can be philosophical. No, I couldn't. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to end there. But I wanted to thank you guys so much for coming, and so I wanted to get you a special present. Uh oh, another prop. Yeah, <laughs> another prop. These both are a bunch of cords. See, I wanted to give you both. Cords. <laughs> I wanted to give you my cord collection because I do believe this is a global crisis. And so I wanted to give you my cord collection. And so I, I, I give you guys this. Is and there micro USB in there? There's, there's all of them. Okay, There's great. all of them. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming. <laughs> really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you guys.